fighting continues to rage between Israel and Hamas in Palestine, and as the conflict continues to escalate, the possibility of a war that could engulf the whole world seems more and more likely. And that may seem dramatic, but Israel and Palestine have been at odds long before this war erupted. But the roots of these tensions could draw the rest of the world into the fight. Yes, religion plays a significant role, as do territorial disputes, but at its core, this is a war between differing ideologies. It's East versus West, albeit on a small scale, and the threat of escalation is ever-present. Some organizations, such as the United Nations Press, even claim that the world is at the brink of an abyss, an abyss that could swallow us whole and at its worst lead to an escalation in nuclear threats. But how real is that threat? Are we truly standing at the edge of an abyss, and if so, is there enough time to pull back? Or will it take just one little shove to turn Israel's war against Hamas into a global conflict? Let's look at the factors that could lead to the war escalating beyond the Middle East, as well as some mitigating factors that might save us from the brink. That examination starts with the regional players involved in the conflict. Israel and Hamas slash Palestine are not the only countries that care about this war, and chief among those other players is Iran. You see, Israel isn't only going after Hamas in this war, it's fighting with Hezbollah, a Lebanon-based Islamic extremist sect that has a different ideology to Hamas but shares one of its biggest goals, the destruction of Israel. For their part, the Israelis aren't taking the threat of Hezbollah joining the fray lying down. They're already attacking Hezbollah fighters, with one conflict on the northern borders of Lebanon on November 11th resulting in the deaths of seven members of that group. That brings the Hezbollah death toll to 78 as of the making of this video with Israel clearly showing no hesitation to move into Lebanon to continue the fighting. Where does Iran come into all this? Hezbollah is considered Iran's most important proxy group, an association that fights with the support of a larger organization, such as a country, though not as part of the supporting country itself. That ultimately means that Israel is fighting Iran, but not directly, by killing members of an organization that Iran directly supports. Couple that with the consistent support that Iran's shown to Hamas since the 1990s, and it's clear that Israel's conflict extends further than the Palestinian border. So it's possible we might see Israel start a direct war with Iran, and that will put Western powers in a difficult position, particularly the United States. After all, tensions between Iran and the US are hardly anything new. Neither is America's support of Israel. Should fighting erupt between Israel and Iran, it seems likely that Israel's allies would get drawn into the fray, the US leading the charge, which would only feed into the anti-West rhetoric for which Iran is known. For their part, the US is already taking measures to limit Hezbollah's and thus Iran's involvement in the war. America's already positioned two naval strike groups in the Mediterranean, serving as a clear threat to Hezbollah if it has any inclination to follow up its threat of getting more directly involved in the conflict if Israel launches ground-based attacks in Gaza. Europe has also sent clear warnings to Iran, don't escalate the conflict, but this might not be enough, with Iran and its proxies potentially becoming a global threat in the months to come. Other countries may also join the fray, with Jordan and Egypt being high on the list. The leaders of both countries are already showcasing fractured relationships with the West. That's seen in their refusals to meet US President Joe Biden following his recent trip to Israel, a stern reminder that neither Jordan nor Egypt supports Israel's war. Neither is a stranger to direct conflict with Israel either. In 1967, Israel fought against Jordan, Egypt, and Syria in what came to be known as the Six-Day War. Though brief, the war resulted in 11,000 Egyptian casualties and 6,000 deaths for Jordan, with the two nations and Syria only managing to kill 700 Israeli soldiers in response. The war resulted in Israel capturing the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, both territories disputed with Palestine. At that point, Jordan bowed out of the conflict at least for a while, but Egypt and Syria fought on. In 1973, they combined to launch a two-fronted attack on Israel to try to reclaim the territory they lost. The resulting Yom Kippur War essentially led to a stalemate, neither side gaining any significant territory, though Egypt claimed it had enjoyed a small victory. Another six years passed before Egypt signed the Camp David Accords, essentially brokering peace with Israel, while Jordan signed the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty in 1994, an uneasy peace has existed between the nations ever since. But peace doesn't mean support, with both Jordan and Egypt showing that they disagree with Israel's actions. Speculatively, the countries might see Israel as power-hungry and determined to take over more Arab and Islamic territory if it succeeds in fully claiming Palestine as its own. If that expansion continues, Egypt and Jordan would fight back. They'd have to. Regional tensions are heightened already, with the refusal of leaders of both countries to meet Biden, showing obvious disapproval and a lack of trust in the West's ability to mitigate the effects of Israel's war against Hamas. 
The situation with Syria is somehow even more complicated. Technically, Israel and Syria have been involved in a cold war of sorts since 1948. Both routinely attack each other, though those attacks seem to be more demonstrations of strength rather than declarations of full-scale war. For instance, Syria occasionally launches mortar attacks against Israel, though these attacks haven't led to an escalation of their conflict. Most mortar shells land in open fields, causing no harm, but Syria is clear on its statements that it considers Israel an enemy. And given that Hamas started working on mending its ties with Syria, and with Iranian guidance in 2022, the country could be seen as offering direct support to Israel's current opponent. The point is simple. Israel and Hamas are not the only players in the current conflict. The situation is much more complicated. Iran and Syria both offer direct support to Hamas. Egypt and Jordan have historical tensions with Israel and have shown through their lack of meetings with Western leaders that they're wary of what Israel is doing. There's also Lebanon, the home of Hezbollah, and a country that's already experiencing minor attacks from Israel to consider. Could this quintet of countries unite with insurgents in Palestine to declare all-out war against what they see as Israel's ambitions to dominate more of the Middle East? And if they do, would the power of that unified force be enough to draw more of the West into the fighting? Those questions remain to be answered. But what we know for certain is that several countries in the Middle East are fighting proxy wars against Israel, even if they're not fighting directly, and this proxy conflict is hardly anything new. Iran has supported insurgent efforts against Israel since 1985, with Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or PIJ, all receiving funding, training, and weapons from Iran in the nearly 40 years since. But if Iran is the more clear enemy, what's unexpected are the proxy conflicts that Israel's fighting with Hamas is causing. Take the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina as an example. That country is no stranger to internal conflict of its own, with Bosniaks, Serbs, and Croats all living together in an uneasy state of peace right now, but that peace may be on the verge of shattering. A recent report from Balkan Insights suggests that both politicians and the people in the country are, quote, taking sides in the conflict. We say that in quotes because this taking of sides is less about supporting Israel or Palestine. Instead, that war is being used as a proxy inside Bosnia and Herzegovina, with the verbal conflicts that have ensued being more focused on propping up internal political agendas. Thankfully, those verbal confrontations haven't turned physical yet. But it highlights the reverberations of the fighting in other corners of the world. For instance, that same report says that Bosnians have long felt a sort of kinship with Palestine, feeling that what Palestine faces now with Israel mirrors what they experienced several decades before. This is exemplified by an October protest in Sarajevo in support of Palestine. A banner reading, Yesterday Srebrenica, Today Gaza, took center stage. Combine that with the fact that most Bosnians are Sunni Muslims, just like most Palestinians, and it's clear that support for Israel is far from absolute in the West. Of course, Bosnians inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina don't have the power to start or perhaps even join a broader conflict that would involve major Western powers, but this brewing discontent could certainly lead to internal fighting using Israel and Palestine as a proxy excuse with other factions inside the country. Coming back to Iran, that country isn't just involved in a proxy conflict with Israel, it's fighting indirectly against Saudi Arabia too. That proxy war has been going on since 1979, when the Iranian Revolution created a Shiite state that Saudi Arabia deemed a threat to its dominance within the Middle East. And it's a complex war. Neither country fights directly, at least not in the same all-out war state that we're seeing between Israel and Hamas but each has supporters, lots of them. And guess which side Israel falls on? Saudi Arabia. Israel supports Saudi Arabia by virtue of the Saudis having issues with Iran. The US also happens to support Saudi Arabia for the same reasons, with their ties deepened by the fact that the US receives more petroleum oil from Saudi Arabia than from any other nation. About 7% of America's petroleum and crude oil comes from the Saudis, so failure to support Saudi Arabia in a conflict that could literally leave America over an oilless barrel. Now consider this possibility. Iran's proxies, Hezbollah and Hamas in particular, are unsuccessful, leading to the groups requesting more direct aid from Iran. The country obliges, plunging itself into a war with Israel. That leads Israel to call upon its supporters in the conflict, namely Saudi Arabia and the United States, with both countries drawing their supporters into the fighting as well. Iran does the same, bringing Egypt, Jordan, and many other Middle Eastern countries into the fray. Sprinkle in regional tensions in places like Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the fighting between Israel and Hamas could be the spark to light fighting that engulfs the whole world. But with all this talk of regional divides and proxy fighting, it's important not to forget why Palestine is such disputed territory in the first place. It's all a religiously significant area. 
The West Bank, Gaza, and Israel make up what's often referred to as Historic Palestine. And within Historic Palestine sits some of the most important cities in Jewish, Islamic, and Christian culture. Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, is the obvious choice for the first city to examine because Jewish people have seen it as their spiritual homeland since the 10th century BC. They consider it the center of the world and where God supposedly resided, making it the holiest city in Jewish doctrine. It's the symbol of Israel and of the Jewish people finding their homeland, the city that King David established and where David's son Solomon built the temple on the same site where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. But it's also important to both Christians and Muslims. Islamic people refer to Jerusalem as Al-Quds or the holy place because it's believed to be where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to the heavens from the rock that takes center stage at the Dome of the Rock. Furthermore, it was the city to which Muhammad and his followers turned when praying, though that city is now Mecca. The fact that ancient Muslims held Jerusalem in such high esteem makes it obvious why many Muslims now dispute Israel's claims to the city. The city also has spent time divided. Between 1948 and 1967, Jerusalem was split in two. Jordan occupied the city's eastern sector, the home of the old city, while Israel claimed the west and the north. The regions were separated from each other with barbed wire fences, with Jordan then going on to prevent Jewish people from accessing holy sites in the east. The desecration of Jewish cemeteries and the destruction of 58 synagogues in Jordan's Jerusalem followed, triggering the previously mentioned war between the two that resulted in Israel receiving full claim to the city. Turning to the more recently disputed territories of Gaza and the West Bank, Israel has laid claim to both for many years. Gaza in particular is seen as a historically important site for Jewish learning and commerce. Even the Talmud, the most important text in Rabbinic Judaism, mentioned Gaza as the site of a yeshiva, which is a site where Jewish people go to study the Torah. The West Bank is perhaps less directly associated with Jewish history outside of Israel's claim that it's part of the Jewish homeland and so should be part of Israel. What's clear here is that the current conflict is not simply about territory, it's about belief, faith, forces that are far more powerful in the minds of those who follow a religion than mere grasps for power or territory. To Israel, fighting against Hamas means it may be able to reclaim sites of religious significance. The word reclaim is important there. To Israel, taking control of Palestine would simply be an act of taking back what's rightfully theirs. Of course, Hamas holds the opposite belief, with its members equally fueled by their faith to keep on fighting. The impact of this religious divide is complex when expanded to the world stage. After all, there are many sects and schools of thoughts within Judaism and Islam, leading to fractures and support on both sides of the fence. For example, a more conservative Muslim may not believe in Hamas's extremist views, but at the same time, they may see the deaths of civilians in Palestine as an attack on their faith regardless. All of this creates tension that could lead to somebody who considers themselves moderate to oppose Israel's approach to the point where they'd be willing to fight against it. You also see this religious divide in the approximate way that countries are split between the conflict. Many of Hamas's allies are Muslim states too, and may see Hamas victory as a way to reinforce their faith. On Israel's side, many of its western allies are traditional Christian states, a religion that holds close ties to Judaism to the point where they share some holy texts. So we're not just seeing a war between people here, we're seeing a culture war, a religious fight that could lead to simmering tensions in other countries boiling over to the point where even more secular nations are forced to join in simply for their own protection. Domestic politics may also play a part in widespread war breaking out. Take Israel's president, Benjamin Netanyahu, and his November 11th refusal to call a ceasefire to the fighting. Netanyahu rejected international calls to stop Israel's attacks outright saying a ceasefire would only be possible if the 239 hostages Israel believes are currently held by Hamas militants were returned. He also says that Gaza will have to demilitarize as a result of any ceasefire, with Israel being given the power to enter Gaza to hunt down militants whenever it wants. Netanyahu also rejected the possibility that Palestinian Authority could regain full control of Gaza at some point in the future. This suggestion, posited by the United States, may be seen by Netanyahu as a concession essentially making Israel's current aggression pointless. Pride is at play here also. That pride extends to both the nationalistic and religious levels. So much of what Israel is and what it represents is tied up in the concept that it is the Jewish homeland. To make supposed concessions now could be seen as a political misstep for the country's president, especially in an era where only 35% of Israel believe it's even possible for Israel and any Palestinian state to coexist peacefully. Interestingly, Netanyahu's desire to keep fighting, perhaps at the behest of his people, 
could be one of the reasons why the war doesn't escalate into a widespread conflict. And that brings us to the other side of the argument. What might prevent the fighting between Israel and Palestine from escalating into a larger war? The key may lie in waning support on both sides of the fence for any sort of extended conflict. That's where Netanyahu's previously mentioned disagreement with the US on a potential of a Palestinian state might come into play. By advancing the battle against Hamas full force, Israel is running counter to American and global calls for a ceasefire. It's also outright rejecting the ideas that the US has for the future, with ABC News even reporting on the Secretary of State Antony Blinken in his comments that the US actively opposes Israel's occupation of Gaza. That anti-occupation stance is naturally shared by many Middle Eastern countries that you typically expect to be supporters of a Palestinian state. Iran and Iraq have both decried Israel's occupation of Gaza, as have Egypt and Jordan, but there are also several Western countries that are stating their opposition to several of the tactics Israel is currently using. Take Ireland, for example. Leo Varadkar, the country's prime minister, has directly condemned Israel for cutting off water, fuel, and power to parts of Palestine, calling the acts a violation of humanitarian law. Norway's foreign minister, Anakin Huitfeldt, had a similar response, telling Israel that the blockade it created around Gaza went beyond the country's right to defend itself, leading to violations of international law. Granted, these are fairly, quote, small voices of Western descent on the international scale, but they still exist, and when combined with the United States' wariness of supporting Israel in any effort to take over Palestine, suggests that Israel's support base isn't as strong as it may first appear. But that's not an issue for Israel right now, as its attacks only extend to the Lebanese border. But it does mean that any further war efforts might see it without partners on which it has traditionally relied. Hamas could take advantage of that situation to present a more united Arab front. But that's unlikely to be the case because it doesn't have the full support from the militaries that it might look to as allies. At the same time, Iran's calling for other Gulf states to actively arm Palestinians, most recently at the November 2023 Riyadh summit. The event, which was attended by 51 leaders who are part of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, left those with more militaristic ambitions disappointed. The overriding opinion coming out of the summit was that moral force rather than physical would be the key to slowing Israel down. Yes, the summit resulted in a lengthy document that contained demands for a ceasefire and the end of weapon sales to Israel, but it stopped short of offering any support to Hamas, showing that many countries in the Gulf region are wary of escalation and would rather do anything they can to prevent it. That's not what Hamas wants to hear. In fact, an opinion piece written by Marwan Bishara goes as far to say that the Arab world has never truly supported Palestine in its conflict with Israel. While Bishara points out that many of these states are quick to voice their support for Palestine, that support dries up when it's time to walk their talk. He claims that those who have the ability to offer direct support simply don't, whereas the few who actually believe in their words of support can't fight alongside Palestine because they don't have the resources. Furthermore, many journalists in countries like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and even Egypt have actively condemned what they view as Hamas's attempts to create war in the region. Only Iran seems to be a direct supporter, and even then, it's essentially using Palestine to further its own ambitions in the Middle East. The conclusion we can draw from this is that most of the world simply doesn't want war. Support for both sides is often voiced, though the follow-up rarely involves direct military support. Yes, Iran supports Hamas and Hezbollah with weapons, but it's not backing its rhetoric by sending over its own army. This has been a trend with the conflict. No Arab nations have stepped up to fight alongside Palestine. The same also applies for Israel, although it does have more support. The US has made a promise to increase its spending on support for Israel by supplying more Iron Dome air defense missiles and as many as 18,000 JDAM kits made to implement GPS guidance into previously unguided bombs. Plus, the US sends about $3.8 billion in security assistance money to Israel every year, which is enough to cover 16% of Israel's military budget, according to Time magazine. However, just like Iran, the US stopped short of sending its own troops to Israel. A cynical mind could even argue that the US is almost using Israel as its proxy to fight against insurgents in the Middle East without having to go there itself. Still, this lack of direct military support shows that most global powers seem to want mediation. We see this most readily in the United States and its efforts to nudge Israel toward a ceasefire that would allow for the creation of a Palestinian state at some point in the future. The US knows what war in the Middle East would mean. It's still licking its wounds from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan too, so it's absolutely trying to avoid being placed in a position where it must support Israel in a wider war against other major powers, Iran in particular. 
Other calls for mediation come from more surprising sources, Turkey and Russia. On October 10, Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish president, held a call with the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. In that call, he made an offer to serve as mediator alongside Guterres and no less than Vladimir Putin in an effort to prevent further conflict. Erdogan also gave a joint speech with Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer, reiterating that call for mediation. He claims to be speaking to other world leaders in an attempt to find a solution. This is an interesting development. Turkey's always had a difficult relationship with Israel, likely stemming from the fact that Turkey generally supports Palestine and has even played host to members of Hamas. But in more recent years, both Turkey and Israel have made an effort to mend fences, leading to the establishment of diplomatic relationships between the two countries. Erdogan likely sees the current conflict as damaging to the thin line it's walking diplomatically, leading to a desire to see the fighting end sooner rather than later. However, it's Russia's calls for a ceasefire that might be the most surprising. After all, this is the very country that's refusing to end its attempts to annex Ukraine despite so many calls from international leaders to stop fighting. And yet, Putin seems to believe that political and diplomatic methods rather than violence are the keys to solving the issue between Israel and Palestine. Still, Russia appears to fall more on the side of Palestine than Israel. Putin himself called for the creation of an independent Palestine, one that would take eastern Jerusalem as its capital. Plus, it's telling that Russia is one of the few European countries not to directly name Hamas as a terrorist organization. So Russia might be trying to paint itself as a peacekeeper while recommending the expansion of Palestine into a state that it could perhaps exert influence over in the years to come. Nevertheless, the calls for mediation are there, and they're coming from some major powers, another sign that the world doesn't want to be plunged into war because of an escalation in fighting between Israel and Palestine. Speaking of Russia, there's another factor at play that might mitigate the possibility of war. Most people are getting tired of it. Putin invaded Ukraine in February 2022, and that war has been raging for nearly two years. From blanket media coverage of the conflict, we seem to have gone to occasional reports. Ukrainians are feeling this weariness coming from the West, too. Toward the end of October 2023, Euronews reported a poll conducted by the Kyiv International Institute of Sociology that found that about twice as many Ukrainians believe the West is tired of war than who believed the same just a few months ago. All told, 15% believe that support from Western countries was waning in September and December of last year. That number as of October 2023 now stands at 30%. There's even a phrase for this feeling, compassion fatigue. Granted, most people in Ukraine, about 60% believe that Western support is still strong. But there is a growing sentiment within the country that many in the West simply want to see an end to the war, potentially with Kyiv and Moscow reaching some sort of agreement in the process. These numbers are interesting. They suggest that some Ukrainians believe that Western people, not necessarily Western leaders, simply don't care anymore. And they could be right. But that weariness could play in favor of the prevention of escalation in war between Israel and Palestine. People may already be so tired of one war requiring their support that they simply don't have it in them to care enough about another war to support their own country getting involved. Having that said, American support for sending troops into Israel has grown compared to support in 1973. That's according to a YouGov poll, which asked 1,000 Americans if they'd be happy to see troops deployed to the region. A quarter of them said yes, up from 11% in a similar poll conducted in 1973. But tellingly, 38% said no and 37% claimed no opinion, demonstrating an apathy for the situation that would make it unlikely for any American president to find widespread support if they declared war on the side of Israel. Perhaps the most convincing argument against widespread war is one that's as old as time, money. The global economy is already bracing itself for the impact of the current conflict, with the situation only to worsen if war were to spread. Oil prices, which are already elevated, would only grow higher if the war involved countries like Iran and Iraq with supply chains experiencing massive disruption. That is the last thing America wants. In fact, the International Monetary Fund believes that an increase of 10% in oil prices, which is definitely possible with the result of this war, would slow down global economic growth by 0.15%. Nobody would be safe from these spikes in oil prices. The average American or Brit or anyone who relies on oil from the Middle East would suffer if the conflict were to spread. Iran getting involved would lead to a spike in oil prices. The same goes for Saudi Arabia, the largest provider of crude oil and petroleum to the US. Those increases would naturally be passed on by energy and petroleum companies, leading to regular people having to pay more at a time when inflation is already too high in many Western countries. Brookings also highlights the impact a larger war could have on several regional countries, pointing out that many have external debts or developing economies, 
that would cause major issues if they joined the fighting. Lebanon has seen its gross domestic product decline by 50% since June 2018. Jordan's situation isn't much better. Its external debts are 110% of its GDP, with a conflict only likely to increase that percentage due to the loss of tourism and international trade. Similarly, Egypt relies heavily on tourism to prop up its economy. With a major war spreading to Egypt, this industry could collapse, leading to dire economic consequences. These are all countries that could potentially support Palestine, but it's against their financial interests to do so. Just as the West getting mired in conflict would run counter to the economic interests of the US. So with all that being said, where does the rest of the world find itself? We're still standing on the precipice of widespread war. However, it'll likely take a pretty heavy push to get us there. Either Israel will have to further its ambitions beyond Gaza, forcing countries that likely don't want to fight right now into a war, which would draw the attention of more of the world, or Iran would have to get directly involved rather than by proxy, which would force the West to react with far more words than condemnation. Still, the war would be against the interests of many of the nations that would likely be involved, particularly financially. That's why we haven't seen any other country rushing to get directly involved with most satisfied to send aid indirectly or talk a lot while doing very little. But what do you think? Is the conflict between Israel and Palestine the trigger for a wider war in the coming years? Or is it possible that tensions will simmer down with the help of mediation to bring everyone back to relative peace? Share your opinions with us in the comment section. Now watch what would happen if China and the US went to war hour by hour. Or check out this video instead.